You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Alice Lanyado. Welcome to Curtain Up, our show about Russian culture in the capital. We've got news and views about the capital's most exciting exhibitions, films, concerts, plays and festivals with a Russian flavour. I'm joined today by Julian Gallant, the director of Pushkin House, the mecca for Russians and Russophiles in London, which every night holds a talk, concert or gathering related to Russia and the former Soviet Union. Julian, welcome. Oh, it's nice to see you. Oleg Kogan is a Ukrainian-born cellist who in 1998 founded the Razumovsky Ensemble, a group of soloists and section leaders from the world's leading orchestras who specialize in chamber music. Oleg has performed with artists such as Yuri Bashmet and on the 18th of June next Monday, he and his ensemble will appear at the Wigmore Hall in London. Welcome, Oleg. Thank you. Alex Dower is also joining us in the studio today. He's a theatre director who's been working in Russian prisons with great success. He's giving a talk tonight at Pushkin House about his work. I'd like to start with you, Oleg. Could you tell me something about the pieces you and your ensemble will play on Monday? Well, on Monday we, we don't play any of the Russian masterworks, but we're playing a piece by Johannes Brahms, which is string quintet in G major, opus 111. It's one of my favorite pieces of chamber music. It has two violas, two violins, and only one cello. And that piece will be matched by Antonin Dvorak's sextet in A major, opus 48, which is uh, written for six players, and I'm joined by my ex-student Pierre Dumange, a French cellist. So are there quite a lot of Russian musicians going to perform that evening, or is yes. it a mixture? It's a mixture, but I will tell you exactly. We have Alexander Sitkovetsky, a Russian violinist, Anya Safonova, an uh, ex-Russian born violinist, that makes two of us, Alexander Zemtsov, a Russian violist, uh, Scott Dickinson, Scottish violist, so that's three Russian and one Scott, I am Russian, and Pierre Dumont French, so we're four against two. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's one of, the, one of the great things about, about the Razumovsky and about you, actually, in, in general, is that you are not a uh, little nationalist, are you? You actually mix uh, people together, and you don't say, well, they play with that sound, they play with that sound. You actually bring people together and mix it all up. Well, that's right. I'm not a nationalist, mm. and the word Razumovsky, exactly. as we know, although he was Russian ambassador to Vienna, Prince Razumovsky, and uh, commissioned, of course, the wonderful quartets which uh, carry his name because he sponsored Beethoven in writing uh, those pieces. He was of Ukrainian descent and his original name was Rozum. And uh, when I started the group, we were all of us Russian speaking, but we were not Russians as such. We were a Ukrainian, a Bulgarian, Vaska Vasilev, another Ukrainian, mm -hmm. Vitovich, who is a principal viola of the Opera House Orchestra, Irina Tibragimov, who is a Tatar, born in Moscow, and so on and so forth. We were all Russian-speaking, but not immediately from Russia. Yeah, and you uh, included other, you include other nationalities in the group, so you keep some spirit of Russian string playing, maybe. But you don't. You're not exclusively focused on, on having just not exclusively. Group, of course nice. not. Yeah. We look for quality, exactly, and of course, yeah. whenever yeah. a certain sure. quality is necessary, mm. we invite these people, mm. and then. I think we learn from them mm. as much as they learn from us. Mm. Mm. So and the cultures get integrated mm. into mm. each other. Alyag, I wanted to ask you, what does it give you to be able to pick and choose from different orchestras every time instead of having the same group of people? Does it actually make it more difficult in some senses in terms of programming as well as more dynamic? You have just nailed it. It gives me the flexibility of the programming. It gives me the incredible freshness of uh, uh, interpretation and also the relationships in the group are fresh so every performance is exciting and there is no kind of routine about it but of course for example if you compare my ensemble with established string quartets like would say the Borodin Quartet or the Amadeus Quartet people who were together for 40 or 50 years we cannot be in competition with those groups in terms of interpretation because these particular groups they develop a unique sound. It's really only the string quartet that requires that kind of togetherness, that 50-year thing where you all stay together, live together, breathe together, um, marry each other's wives and so on. I mean, that, that's really only the string quartet, isn't it? All the rest of the groups allow for a bit of, a bit of movement and more of a mix-up of players. Well, and that's change, right. Yeah. And for that particular mm. reason, Razumovsky Ensemble mm. does not play string mm. quartets. Mm. String quartet is a media which does require this 
incredible sure. unity. So I have got yeah. the impression that there are an awful lot of string players from Russia who have really settled into orchestras in, in London. Would you say that's the case, Julian? Oh, yes, um, that's definitely true. I mean, the, the, Russia does have a, a great discipline and culture of string playing and great string playing and of course they've taken positions in UK orchestras and in groups and they found livelihoods in the UK. So, Has that happened uh, more than with players of other instruments or, or with singers? Certainly with pianists as well, with singers too, less in the wind department because of course wind departments are so strong for example in the UK and Germany um, and in America but the string playing from Russia has spread all over the world. Why is that? What's so strong about the string playing amongst say the Marinsky Orchestra? Uh -huh. It is very unfortunate that the arts are not always supported enough. So quite often British orchestras uh, play with one rehearsal only. So here it's partly a matter of funding? Yes. And musical yes. education and access to music in school, which I know in Russia is still much better, still mostly free. Yes. Well, Russian yes. orchestras have a, they have a different rehearsal system. They rehearse for they have a four-hour rehearsal period, which divides up more than the three-hour rehearsal period that, in the UK, which I like very much, and a lot of other British conductors who've gone to work in Russia like it very much. They enjoy rehearsing there, and there are just more rehearsals, so you have time to get beyond the, the sort of basics. I'd like to move on to Alex. I'd like to ask you about your yeah. work. You're doing a talk <coughs> about it tonight. Yeah. You've worked in Russian prisons and put on plays in Russian with the inmates. Yes. Yeah. How did this start? What motivated you to, to start working in Russian prisons? Some people might be quite nervous of that. It was an invitation, actually, from um, Kirill Serebrenikov, the director at the Moscow Arts Theatre. I met him in London in 2008, and we were talking about our experiences and so on. We're both directors, and I had worked in prisons in the UK. He is artistic director of Territory Theatre Festival, and um, they like to work in unusual spaces. So he suddenly thought, wow, that could be an interesting thing to do. So he invited me to, to direct in Perm. In the prison colony? In the prison colony, yeah. Prison colony 29 in Perm. How was that when you first arrived? Was it worse than you expected? Was it, it was actually better than I expected. I mean, I suppose any English person thinking of a Russian prison is kind of a very daunting idea for some reason. I suppose because of the history of the gulags and so on. But... I found the the governor and his his officers to be incredibly supportive of us, to be very humane, to have a very good positive attitude towards the prison and the prisoners. And this was a male prison? Yes, a male prison, yeah. I've worked in female prisons and the next prison I'm going to work in, in Razan, is a female prison, prison for teenage girls. There are a lot of differences with, for example, in the Perm prison, the men were living in dormitories, which isn't something you see in UK prisons. You mean sharing big rooms sharing with bunk beds? Sharing big rooms, like about 50 guys to a big room with bunk beds, yeah. What kind of crimes were they there for? A, t a complete mixture. Basically, it was a, it was a um, lower security prison. So it was guys who were either in for short sentences or coming to the end of long sentences. So there was a complete mixture of thieves, murderers, violent crimes, sex offenders... So there's some quite mixture. tough men in there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And how did you find it, putting on plays with them? Did it they was, accept you from the beginning? Or? Um, I think they were, they were kind of anxious about what might happen because most of them had never done any kind of theatre activity before. And I think there's a natural kind of concern about what they're going to be asked to do by this foreign theatre director. Am I going to suddenly have them like running around embarrassing themselves? which obviously I was very careful not to do. So I think there was a, quite a degree of um, yeah, nervous anticipation. <laughs> I mean, they took to it incredibly well, and they did an incredibly good job. What did they perform? They performed uh, three short stories, one by Isaac Barbel, My First Goose, from the Red Cavalry series. Then a Chekhov short story, The Burbot, or Nalim, The Fish. Mm. And then a story written by one of the prisoners. It's good to work with short stories with, with prisoners because it's a more kind of familiar mm. medium. If you give them a script mm -hmm. where there's just a load mm. of lines being read and there's, and there's often not much character description, you don't get the world of the, the mm. story, it's kind of a bit foreign to people and it's a bit strange. Yeah, you couldn't just give them a script and say, learn that as you would to a, a professional no. actor, could you? You have, no. to, you, have to, you have to bring them in, you have to bring them right into the role and, and actually make them live the role a little bit, don't you? Well, you, you have to do that with a normal actor, but it's yeah. much harder to do that with a normal actor mm. than with a prisoner, in fact. Right. I work mainly with untrained people. Why is it easier? Because they don't have preconceptions about what acting mm. is. Actors usually have preconceptions about what acting is. Apart from the, the performance itself and uh, getting prisoners to do acting, this had an incredible rehabilitative effect as well didn't it on those criminals what I really 
realised was that the, the science of acting and the way I, of working that I had with the men was very, very beneficial for them. They got a lot out of it. Did they um, tell you about that or did you see it? I saw it. The governor told me about it. The officers tell me. I mean, I could see the change going on in front of me. And what I could what see, kind of change? Well, Can you give you me know, an example? What, the guy who I had playing um, Savitsky, is it? Who's the commander in the Barbel piece. When I first came in, he was one of those guys who couldn't really look you in the eye when he was talking. His face was constantly moving around. His eyes were constantly moving around. Within two weeks, he was standing on stage performing as an a very, very high-status army commander giving instructions and ordering people around. And he was able to do it because I guided him through a process where he was able to put his himself to the side and just think the thoughts of the character. Mm. And when, when you do that as an actor, what you learn is that you don't have to think the way you've always thought. You can choose how you want to think because you have a very clear experience of doing that by being in a play. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. This is Curtain Up, the programme about Russian culture in the capital. <music> Lastly, I wanted to very quickly mention what uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg Theatre Goers are <laughs> talking about this week. Midsummer Night's Dream, which is a co-production with the ENO, has just opened in Moscow. It has scenes of paedophilia on stage, which has upset some people and some parents. The Moscow authorities went to see part of the opera on Sunday and were awaiting their verdict. There's a lot of modern opera on in Russia at the moment. We've just seen the opening of Boris Godunov in St. Petersburg, which also had a mixed reception. Julian... What do you think about modern operas? Well, Midsummer Night's Dream is a particular case. Of course, this is Benjamin Britten's, one of his best operas, no doubt, on a musical basis. But it carries with it themes, the themes of homosexuality and homosexual paedophilia as well. So this is brought out in the E&O you know, production. And of course, I mean, you know, read the reviews, read the, uh, read the accounts and so on. This was really brought out because it was set in a school. And of course, these themes are brought out and exaggerated. Um, and rightly so. I mean, the production's great. Taken to Moscow, where homosexuality is is not is not nearly the open thing that it is in this country uh, in society. I think it was bound to cause that reaction. Um, so and, no uh, surprise, really. Not really any surprise. I'm slightly surprised that it went to the law, but it did, and we'll have to see what happens. But it's not the first time that modern opera has been shockingly put on in Moscow. I was there actually a couple of days ago, and I was talking to Dima Bertman, Dmitry Bertman, who's the head of Helicon Opera, um, and he said, you know, the great big grin on his face. Have you heard about the big scandal? And I thought, well, that, that is the absolutely the pot calling the kettle black, because Dima Bertman, of course, brought whole sexual element into all his opera productions, into Carmen and Traviata, and a lot of the Western repertoire operas that he took to Moscow um, in the 90s and in the 2000s um, and gave them this incredibly modern overhaul, usually with a very, very strong sexual element to it. Um, and what about political operas? Mm. We've just seen Boris Godunov premiere in St. Petersburg. Mm. They've brought it to mm. right up to today mm. with an English director, yeah. Graham Vick. There's been a mixed reception in Russia because some people see it as illuminating modern Russian and some people see it as parodying and feel, feel a bit insulted to have people stripping in front of icons and prostitution, prostitution and, uh, yeah. right on stage. I think I can understand that, Oleg, but I'd like to hear your view. Various things in art depend on the audience support and uh, if you start showing off and undressing on stage and uh, playing naked or uh, things, you know, audience will buy tickets and maybe that's another way. Well, a lot of people don't want to go to the theatre and just have to think about someone else's naked body for the whole evening. Yeah. I mean, if I go to see a play, I want to think about the story. I don't want to think about... Because you can't take your eyes off it. It's a natural human thing. It's kind of you're just there. And Distracting. You're like, Should I look at it? Oh, my God, will they see me looking at it? And it just takes over the whole thing. That's why I think it's so I think, damaging. I think, I think Oleg's now, uh, uh, and uh, Oleg and Alex are actually a, a bit sort of post postmodern uh, here. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think Moscow is one, one stage behind. Now, just before I go, I should say that there are three more interesting events this week. On Wednesday, Natalie Gorman is performing piano pieces at St. John Smith Square. She's playing Beethoven's Variations and a selection by Tchaikovsky, Skriabin and Rachmaninoff. And jazz saxophonist Shenya Strigalov is playing at Charlie Wright's International Bar in Hoxton also on Wednesday. Plus tonight the Belarus Free Theatre opens its new production of Minsk 2011 at the Young Vic. Thanks to all my guests today and thanks to Julian Gallant of Pushkin House for joining me as well in this edition of Curtain Up, the programme that tells you all about Russian cultural events in the capital.
You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Alice Lanyado. Stay with us. So are there quite a lot of Russian musicians going to perform that evening or is yes. it a mixture? It's a mixture, but I will tell you exactly. We have Alexander Sitkovetsky, a Russian violinist, Anya Safonova, an uh, ex-Russian born violinist that makes two of us, Alexander Zemtsov, a Russian violist, uh, Scott Dickinson, Scottish violist. So You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Alice Lanyado. Welcome to Curtain Up, our show about Russian culture in the capital. We've got news and views about the capital's most exciting exhibitions, films, concerts, plays and festivals with a Russian flavour. I'm joined today by Julian Gallant, the director of Pushkin House, the mecca for Russians and Russophiles in London, which every night holds a talk, concert or gathering related to Russia and the former Soviet Union. Julian, welcome. Oh, it's nice to see you. Oleg Kogan is a Ukrainian-born cellist who in 1998 founded the Razumovsky Ensemble, a group of soloists and section leaders from the world's leading orchestras who specialize in chamber music. Oleg has performed with artists such as Yuri Bashmet and on the 18th of June next month... Any of the Russian masterworks, but we're playing a piece by Johannes Brahms, which is string quintet in G major, opus 111. It's one of my favorite pieces of chamber music. It has two violas, two violins, and only one cello. And that piece will be matched by Antonin Dvorak's Sextet in A major, opus 48, which is uh, written for six players. And I'm joined by my ex-student Pierre Dumange, a French cellist. Today, he and his ensemble will appear at the Wigmore Hall in London. Welcome, Oleg. Thank you. Alex Dower is also joining us in the studio today. He's a theatre director who's been working in Russian prisons with great success. He's giving a talk tonight at Pushkin House about his work. I'd like to start with you, Oleg. Could you tell me something about the pieces you and your ensemble will play on Monday? Well, on Monday we don't play 